Welcome everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining us. So my name is Polly Savage. I'm the lecturer in Art History of Africa at SOAS. And I'm really delighted to welcome you all to this event. So it's the second in a series of talks that are hosted in partnership between the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art and SOAS School of Art. And this has been organized by the SOAS Center of African Studies. So thank you to Angelica and to Stephanie for organizing this and to Gus as well. So we have two really extraordinary guests tonight. We're very excited about today's talk. Um, and I think they're both familiar to many of us. Um, I think in the last 20 years of art history at SOAS, I don't think a year has passed without a really in-depth discussion of Yinka's work. Um, and every year these discussions bring new insights about the entangled relationships between Britain and Africa and about how we might destabilize notions of cultural and national identity and globalization. And, you know, this, it keeps on giving this sort of wonderful nuanced um, energy to, to these discussions. So um, we're, we're kind of incredibly happy to have Yinka here talking with us tonight. Um, so he doesn't need much introduction. His work has been obviously exhibited and collected by major institutions around the world. And he has this really extraordinary list of accolades. So he was nominated for the Turner Prize in 2004. Uh, he completed the commission for the Trafalgar Square Fourth Plinth in 2010. He was elected a Royal Academician in 2013. He was an awarded an MBE in 2004 and a CBE in 2019. And most recently, he has just been um, awarded the Whitechapel Gallery Art Icon Award. So that will be um, presented in March this year, I believe. Um, and also he's been in the news recently because he's been commissioned to produce a sculpture in Leeds, which is in memory of David Oluwale, who is a Nigerian who died after police harassment in 1969. So that's very exciting. And I know he's gonna talk quite a lot tonight about some of the projects that he's working on at the moment. Um, one of these is the Gas Foundation Artist Residency Program, which uh, is due to open later this year in Ijebu and in Lekki in Lagos, Nigeria. So we're really excited to hear more about your, your recent projects and, and to hear more of a, a reflection on your practice as well. So thank you so much for being here, Yinka. Um, in conversation with Yinka, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Gus Casely Hayford. Uh, Gus is a research associate and long-term friend of SOAS. He's an art historian who writes and lectures and broadcasts widely on African culture. And he has an equally extraordinary list of accolades. So in addition to presenting the major BBC series, The Lost Kingdoms of Africa, he's held former posts as the Director of Art Strategy at Arts Council England, the Director of INNOVA, director of the UK's largest ever African art season, Africa 05, the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art, and most recently he's now the inaugural director of the V&A East at in London, which is opening hopefully in 2023, is that right Gus? Um, this is going to be a five-story museum and a collections and research centre. Um, it's currently under construction at the Olympic Park in Stratford. So this is all incredibly exciting and we're just really thrilled to have you here. So thank you so much, both of you, for being here. So the structure of the session will be roughly as follows. Uh, Yinka and Gus will have a discussion for probably about 40 to 50 minutes um, and then we will open it up to questions and answers. So please submit your questions in the chat box and we've got um, a nice good amount of time to to um, deal with questions and answers and have a discussion at the end. So I will hand over to both of you. Thank you again for being here. Thank you so much, Polly. And thank you to everyone at, at, at SOAS and NAMAFA um, for making this possible. I mean, this is an absolute genuine pleasure to get the chance to speak to a great personal friend, but also um, a genuine hero of mine, um, Ginka, Ginka Shonabare. Um, and, you know, for me, he's someone who I've spoken to a number of times, but every single time I speak to him, I think um, his work is ever more prescient, ever more timely. Welcome, Ginka. Welcome. Lovely to speak to you. Well, no, thank you for having me. And, you know, it's a pleasure to be, um, you know, 
having this conversation with you. Oh, thank you. And what, what a time to be uh, in conversation. I mean, if you look at the ambient politics, uh, polarizing politics, attitudes that are related to Brexit, um, potential unraveling of the UK, as I saw in the news today, the rise and then the fall of, of Trump. You know, these are all things, as I was saying, that make your work feel ever more critical, prescient, timely. I mean, have you felt that yourself? You know, well, yes, it, it's, um, you know, one thing about humanity is that we, uh, we keep repeating history and we keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And, you know, the, when, uh, you know, Trump was elected, and then we started seeing all the images of, um, you know, uh, black people being um, harassed by the police and being killed. Now the world was seeing that for the first time, right? But actually many black people always knew that was happening. And, you know, parents would say to their children, you know, don't, you know, you have to behave in a certain way when you, when you see the police. And, you know, it's a kind of a very kind of sad thing that the world is now actually coming to terms with something that we have known for a very long time. And, you know, it, it's a shame because I, I think that after the civil rights uh, movement in the United States, you know, I'm talking, and also, you know, I'm talking about 68 and the kind of, you know, post Vietnam period, things, you know, we, we imagined things were starting to get better. I mean, we imagined that. And then of course, within the academy itself and the emergence of post-colonial theory and also you know, the decolonization of culture generally, which is a, de a debate that we all seem to be having right now. But the issue of decolonization is something that I've explored in my practice since I would say probably the early 90s, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I've been exploring those issues. And so I don't quite understand how in 2021, we're still where we are. Um, you know, I'm just constantly baffled by that. Mm -hmm. And it's not just that we're where we are, but now that history itself is under attack, that we're in this thing which has been defined by the right as being in a culture war in which um, we're actually wrestling with ideas of, of narrative and truth and veracity. And, you know, we're in a territory which usually politics isn't that invested in, in thinking about the meaning of, of, of the culture that surrounds us. And, and um, you know, your work, has been a kind of constant beaker, beacon for helping us to deal with some of these issues of history and, and its veracity. Um, I mean, how have you felt about that? I mean, as, as you've seen it, have you seen, you know, statues actually being pulled down, but also a new generation of statues being erected? Well, you know, may I start, continue our conversation by asking you, what does the term woke mean to you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not so, it's, it's something that every time I hear it, it gives me great pain the way in which that word has been used as a, as, you know, as, as a way of, of diminishing the pain and the, the, the search for a kind of recalibration of the terms in which we navigate the past and the culture around us. And it's, it, for me, it comes out of a, of, a, of a move for greater equity within the cultural sphere and an, an, an awakening to a sense of the misjustice and the way in which history and wider cultural narratives have only told the, the stories of of a few and it's institutions like SOAS and and NAMAFA which have tried from their very conception to to find the space for other voices and so there was in its original instantiation um, a movement of people who became awakened to a wider kind of discourse 
And of course, that has now been tarnished by the right who saw that as being something of a threat to the sorts of histories that they felt comfortable with. And of course, like always, it's using words to diminish people's pain, to diminish people's search for the truth. So is that, is that a word that um, would be in use in the United States? I'm not too sure if, um, if that word is actually used in the United States. It may have been at some point used by people who generally talked about themselves in that context, but um, now it's just used pejoratively to, well, I don't think just, but for the, it's used mostly as a pejorative statement about um, minority cultures and the support of them, which is, for me, is, is so painful. Yeah, but you see, the reason I bring this up as well, and also it's very important that, you know, um, you know, our friends in the United States also understand the context of some of this. Um, recently in Britain, I think it's the community secretary who said that, um, you know, hordes of people are trying to destroy British history by bringing down statues and, you know, that people have this sort of woke attitude and they're, they're trying to uh, destroy kind of British history. And this is not true. I mean, people, you know, I don't see hordes of people in the streets trying to bring out, bring down statues. I mean, I think that we need to correct some of the mistakes of history. And also history itself, as you know, is dynamic. So history kind of continues, it, it, you know, um, even public statues are forever changing. And what's important to one generation is not necessarily important to another generation. And if you're a black person and the images of uh, former slave owners, and you literally feel belittled and insulted in the city that you, you live in, and you don't feel a part. I mean, surely it's right to question those things and to readdress them. And so there's a, you know, there's a desire now from the, the uh, right to basically, um, you know, stifle people and to stop them sort of expressing their views. I mean, surely we wouldn't want, um, you know, images and statues of uh, Nazi leaders um, in our cities. I mean, we would have to question them. And so I don't know why it's fine to have statues of former slave owners that we then have to confront every single day. Mm -hmm. And we're not actually breaking the law and we're not even trying to bring down some of those statues. Uh, we, we, you know, we understand the history. I'm not suggesting here that history should be erased. That's not what I'm suggesting. But I'm suggesting that we need to have conversations about these things and then decide whether we want to move those statues, of course, in consultation with local people, you know, whether we want to move them into museums where we can learn about them and possibly don't make you know the mistakes that we we made before but i i certainly don't see anyone from the black community trying to remove public statues i don't see that mm -hmm. so there's yeah. a bit of an exaggeration in the response here i i totally agree yinka um, i mean uh, your work in the public sphere has been something that has meant a, a, a huge amount to me. I mean, can we look at some of your 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 work now? I mean, for, for, yeah, absolutely. For, for me, some of your practice has really kind of transformed my thinking around so many things. Um, one of my favourite pieces, particularly as as a uh, an, an ex-director of Innova, which commissioned um, this particular series, um, but also as now my current employer that we we actually own um, um, one set of these works, um, I, a diary of a Victorian dandy. And I recently wrote about this 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 series um, 
um, in relation to Black Lives Matter, because I think it, it's still so powerful, it still resonates so powerfully. Could you tell me something about um, this work and why you feel it really speaks um, uh, to this time as well? Okay, so this work was made uh, in 1998. Um, you know, at that time, th there was a question of visibility for Black artists and um, also discrimination and generally the lack of opportunity. And I was at that time exploring my own history, the relationship to Britain. And of course, you know, I, I was born in London, but I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, and then came back to the UK. And I kind of was really exploring that colonial history and my place within that as an artist of African origin. And so the first thing I did was to, um, you know, I was actually looking at Hogarth's uh, race, um, uh, Hogarth's race progress. And I wanted to somehow reinterpret that because whenever you saw those sort of, um, you know, 18th century paintings, and also even the 19th century, uh, people of African origin tend to be somewhat in the background. You know, they might be valets, butlers, you know. Um, and I felt I wanted to reimagine that person and reimagine myself in, in history. And so, but I also wanted to do it with a very large audience. And of course, the, the place to do that was on the London Underground. So actually, the, the photographs were first displayed on the London Underground um, in London. And as you know, you know, literally thousands of people see that. And I wanted to move that work outside of the gallery setting and to put it in the public realm. So I guess you could then say that uh, Diary of a Victorian Dandy was actually my first sort of public work of art. And can um, we, can you talk us through what we're actually seeing as we- Yeah, so what you're seeing, I mean, it's kind of a bit back to front, but the Dandy uh, wakes up in the morning and he goes, so this is, a, this. what I was doing really was, I was deconstructing the leisure pursuits of the aristocracy given that those leisure pursuits of the aristocracy was actually then, um, you know, allowed to happen because of their access to cheap labor and slavery. So it's a kind of a reverse um, addressing, you know, of, of history. So if you were to kind of go forward, you, you, you will then see, uh, um, you know, the rest of it. Mm. So can we go to the next? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, so you know, the, he the dandy kind of woke up in, in in the morning, then went for you know to play billiards, went to his library, and then you know, and then basically indulged in the evening. And um, so, if we were to kind of uh, go back again. Yeah, then, then, you know, that's kind of what's uh, what's happening there. So one thing that you will notice with my work is that there is a degree of, there's a degree of play and humor in, in it. Uh, because, you know, this was in the context of very serious um, post-colonial art practice. And there were many artists who were doing what I regard as very important political art. But I felt that I, you know, actually I wanted to mock uh, the whole situation by using, you know, what, what I would describe as a sort of, you know, gallows humor, really. I, I, I wanted to introduce a degree of, um, you know, of humor into the work. And um, yeah, a degree of humor. But, it, but it's also that there's something which is, is so, 
serious and resonant that f for anyone who knows those Hogarth images of that period, that there are, there is kind of diversity illustrated in them, but usually the figures of African descent are servants who sit usually on the very edge of the frame. Usually they're, 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 they're very evidently carrying something in service of the actual situation. And um, very often Hogarth would use them humorously, um, but it is very evident that they are integral to the situation in that they were actually servicing everything that was happening, but at the same time, they were peripheral to it. And here, that the, the, the central figure, the dandy, is a man of African descent. And it, it inverts all of that, the whole kind of enlightenment thing, which you see demonstrated through so many areas still of the arts that in which the, 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 the key figure, the perspective through which we look at our images is set and that this subverts all of that. And I've, I've found that always kind of to be, you know, powerful in a way that spoke to the very heart of, of so much that I had learned and also the whole sector within which I worked. Yes, no, you know, absolutely. And, you know, what you're talking about there really is, is empowerment and sort of feeling empowered and, you know, and what that meant. And, you know, and it was very kind of liberating for me to have actually done this work because I think in a way it also acted as a catalyst or a trigger for what I was to do subsequently. Um, because I gained a sense of empowerment through going through this, this process. Hmm. Could we look at some more of your work now? Could we yes, go on to yes. the... So if we go forward. Yeah, Scramble for Africa. Yes. Um, and I mean, this series, it deals with that, that period that in the latter half of the uh, of the nineteenth century, when Africa, you know, is is basically set upon by the powers of Europe and divided up, and it's I mean, for an institution like SOAS that uh, you know that this is the territory within which it so many of its courses are, are, are actually fixed. And it's such an amazing rendering of that. I mean, what, 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 how, how, what drew you to this particular subject area and what made you want to, to um, recreate it in this way? Okay, so, you know, in Nigeria, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a civil war uh, in the 60s and you know, Nigeria is, um, so you have all the kind of different tribes connected, but they are in a country called Nigeria. Now, Britain created this idea of Nigeria and also many other African countries, you know, not just Britain, France, you know, um, and so, you know, I started to really think about you know, Africa itself and Europe's relationship to Africa and the way that Africa was divided up by 14 European nations. And the territories were created within that based on the uh, interests of European countries without necessarily consulting, you know, us Africans about what we wanted to do, you know, and then and of course, we're aware of the Berlin Conference and when Africa was divided up. And then I, I just thought to myself, what were they thinking or what, you know, what was actually going through their minds? And also, I wanted to be, you know, a fly on the wall and just kind of, in a way, mock that moment. So there's a degree of parody because I see I see them as sort of, you know, um, headless uh, European countries, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, dividing up Africa. So there's a degree of humor about it. You, you know, the, 
the, the kind of quiet pleasure. I mean, it's, you know, it's a bit macabre because you don't see blood, but you don't see blood, <laughs> but there's a macabre element to the piece because in the sense that, you know, I've, I've literally just guillotined <laughs> all of them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but it's done in the manner of a gentleman, you know, uh, there's no blood. It, it's uh, terribly polite. Uh, the way the way it's been done, uh, but you know, again, you know, of course, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, I wouldn't hurt a fly, you know, but but, but in my art, I can I can sort of reenact uh, what I would have really liked to have done to them, but I obviously I can't do it, but in my art I can, <laughs> and that and that gives me a lot of satisfaction. It gives us all a sense of satisfaction and catharsis, so we're grateful on our behalf. Could we go on to the the next? Oh, these are yeah. So that's the detail there. Yes. And the creation of these works, how you know that the the sourcing of the fabrics of the of 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 the the chairs and the, the table, I mean, and, and the inlay, and how, how has all of that happened, Yinka? Well, you know, I used to, I, I used to live in South London, innit? <laughs> <laughs> South London. So I used to go to Brixton Market, right? So, and I, I used to buy the fabrics at Brixton Market. And, um, and, you know, that's also at the time, I mean, that was a kind of a radical thing to do because, you know, I wanted to make my art from something that comes from the market. Yes. And I went to the shop in Brixton and I was talking to them about the fabrics. And then I was told, oh, well, you know, they're Indonesian influenced fabrics produced by the Dutch and then, you know, made on the industrially and then sold within West Africa, of course you know, people might challenge me and say the fabrics are now made in Africa. Of course, I do know that. And the fabrics are made uh, also uh, within the African continent. Um, but I'm interested in the trade routes and the trajectory of the, of the actual fabrics. And as a metaphor for the kind of trade routes that many, um, you know, people of African origin have kind of, you know, uh, gone through and so, um, you know, but I, I also have a, um, I have a number of, my, so my studio is quite large. I work with a number of different uh, skills. So there are costumiers uh, who work for the studio and there are also set designers and photographers. And, you know, so I work with a wide range of people depending on the projects, you know, I'm kind of, sort of trying to do. So we pretty much put these things together the way you would, the way you would put together a stage set, mm. you know, so, um, but as you know, my practice is quite broad. So, you know, I, I kind of work on a, in a wide range of ways and I have the skilled people within my studio to do those. Amazing. Can, can we go on to the next slide, please, Ruth? Now, this is an, another one of my favorite pieces that um, sits, that sat in one of um, the most kind of important pieces of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, public spaces in Britain, uh, Trafalgar Square, Nelson's ship in a bottle. And in Trafalgar Square, that there is a single plinth that had been empty and, and Yinka's um, Nelson's ship in a bottle was chosen as a work that should sit on that plinth, which if you were to stand just behind it, you would be facing down toward Parliament and Buckingham Palace. It's right at the very centre of things. So Yinka, can you tell us a bit about this work? Yes, yeah, so um, I was invited to put work on the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square. Now, in Trafalgar Square, there is uh, Nelson's column. Now, the reason Trafalgar Square is actually called Trafalgar Square, that's to commemorate the Battle of Trafalgar in which uh, Admiral Nelson uh, won that battle against uh, Napoleon. Now, the French had more control of the seas, but when uh, Britain won that war, the empire was then able to um, expand further. And 
I find that battle kind of interesting in terms of the story of my own history and identity in the sense that perhaps if Britain had lost that war, I perhaps would be speaking French now. And, um, you know, but Napoleon lost and Britain, Britain won. So, and then, you know, the flagship of Nelson is HMS Victory. And so what I chose to do with the flagship was to um, change the sails into African textiles and then put it in a bottle. I wanted public art that's somewhat serious yet playful. So, you know, most people want to know how did the, uh, you know, how did the ship get, you know, how did you put the ship in a bottle? But um, that seems to be the, uh, the most important questions, you know, I'm often asked by London cab drivers, you know, they want <laughs> to know how, how I got to the ship into the bottle. I often say to them, well, you know, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> But um, no, so it was a, a fun thing to make, but also I wanted to make public sculpture that the general public would find magical and engaging because I don't really want to make art that the public don't feel they can engage with. Mm. And, and it speaks to this particular moment when, uh, you know, public, art is being contested and, and reconsidered and it is wonderful to see work which which speaks to the contemporary moment but also sits within a historical context comfortably and I think you know for for, for those reasons I think I would love to see more of this sort of work dealing with contentious complex issues but dealing with them in ways that as you say are playful and um, which will elicit in young, old, the invested or not, you know, as a, a response? Yes, no, I think it's absolutely important because I, I, of course, you know, I want to make work, but I, I'm not making work just for the intelligentsia because the issue of access is central to my practice, you know, so I don't want to be a snob in my work, you know, but I think it's absolutely important that, you know, one is not necessarily uh, um, sort of dumbing down by doing that. You know, I, I think it's important to, to that you, you can actually engage serious issues and produce exciting work. Mm. You know, and it's, it's important. So I don't think that you have to compromise on, on one thing or the other. Do you see what I mean? Absolutely, absolutely. Can we go on, please, Ruth? Okay, uh, next, next image. Oh yes, of course, the um, the British Library, which it's just a stunning piece. I mean, to look at it here in these images, but to stand adjacent to it, it's it's one of those pieces that it changes you it as a, a way of dealing with complex issues of narrative and history it is deeply moving but it's also just so exquisitely beautiful all of these books bound in these beautiful textiles um, but also ordered in this way but also telling us the lives of all of these discrete authors but also simultaneously um of histories that have been denied as well. I've, I've found it an immensely moving piece. I mean, could, could you tell me something about its creation and its impact? Yes, so I was invited to show work at the Brighton Festival in the United Kingdom. Now that coincided with, um, that, that well, I don't know what's happened to the images. <laughs> The, the, the images have a mind of their own. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so, um, so that coincided with Brexit. And, um, you know, because, unfortunately, because of Brexit, you know, there was a rise in uh, xenophobia. And 
And then I thought, well, you know, I don't quite understand why people, you know, I don't understand the reason for xenophobia. You know, uh, Britain is a very diverse uh, country. Um, many, many foreigners have made huge contributions to Britain and also the makeup of this island. You know, we, we are from everywhere. And so a number of people, you know, from the Queen to um, many, many contemporary um, artists, writers, who have made significant contribution to Britain. You know, their families have come from elsewhere. So I wanted to actually celebrate that. And I, so I created this uh, library called the British Library uh, with those textiles, with the names of those uh, people, first and second gen generation uh, immigrants on the spines of the books. But I, most importantly, I also added the names of people opposed to immigration. How interesting. Uh, but I wanted something that's entirely immersive and so that, you know, there's just this sensory overload so that you're, you're physically, you know, immersed in this, uh, you know, it's just kind of something that's kind of too beautiful, but also, in a way, uh, kind of dark as well. So there's a degree of darkness. I mean, one aspect of my work, there's always a degree of contradiction within the work. So you're looking at something really beautiful on the one hand, but then you're also, there's also the kind of subtext of, of, uh, of pathos. So, so the subtext is always quite important. Mm. And, and this, um, I believe it sits in the Tate now. What, what have been the reactions of, of, of visitors? Because Tate itself as an institution which is, is grappling with issues as, as the whole of our sector is um, at the moment of, of, of history, of the future, of dealing with you know, the complexity of changing Britain. I mean, how, how has it been um, seen there? Well, I mean, the work has been incredibly well received at the Tate. Yes. I mean, they have so many visitors there, you know, to see that piece. And people are kind of, you know, doing talks about it. Uh, I mean, the great thing about, you see, unfortunately, because of COVID, uh, the Tate is unable to do that right now. But there are some tablets there where you can actually enter the story of your own family, your own immigration family. And, that, and there is a website which people can also go to. Uh, it's the British Library um, website. Um, and on that website, you can actually read all the fascinating stories that people have entered. So there's that kind of participatory element to it, yeah. um, which is great. But unfortunately, because of COVID, they can't really carry on that part right now. Mm. But it's, it's also cathartic, you know, our history as, and our presence has been so, so um, compromised, denied. And, you know, even now in the context of culture war, et cetera, that many people have to fight for their space. And it's wonderful to deal with, with this as a, as, as a set of issues, both as something which is as, as, as a point of catharsis, but also to deal with, the points of contention that this is the stories of the people who have tried to posit some of the kind of you know the the, the terrible things about about race and Africa as well as those who've uh, 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 and peoples of African descent and and immigration as well as those who've who've actually um, who've who've championed it. So it's about all of those areas of contention. Yes, no, absolutely. Um... And, you know, this is, you know, Gus, this is us, you know, I mean, this is, you know, you look around Britain, everyone's got a story, you know, of one kind or the other, you know. I mean, I think Britain has been described before as the, as the mongrel nation. Yeah, so, but, we, but we, fight to, we fight to not uh, acknowledge that history. And it's wonderful to have you and your work and artists like you reminding us 
of the complexity of our history and of our responsibility to navigate it with care. So, you know, I, it's, it's just so wonderful to see this work and um, to experience it. I mean, if you get the chance to stand um, in close proximity to the, these works, it's, it's deeply moving, deeply affecting. Could, could we go on please, Ruth? So here you see the kind of particular bays and how did you, how did you choose the particular works that went into this? Well, so what I actually thought about culture as a whole and culture in the broader sense of it. So there are people who've made contributions to the sciences, to the arts, to literature, to, to theater. So, and it's sort of broken down in that way. So that's how it's been done. Amazing. Could we go on please, Ruth? And this is its kind of twin, the African library. And, and you know, as again, it's another kind of area of true frustration of our histories being erased, systematically forgotten, um, not invested in, you, you know, that idea of Hegel that Africa being a place almost without history and narrative. And the, the idea that I came away with seeing this piece, I saw it in South Africa and found it again, very moving. This investment in, in the affirmation of African narrative, African stories, African history. I found it very, very powerful indeed. Yes, you see, there are a number of people who's, you know, Africans throughout history, we may talk about imperialism, but it's, it should be noted by a lot of people that throughout that period and throughout the period of difficulty, Africans haven't been passive people. You know, Africans have been very proactive. Africans have had the independence movements. They've had the struggle. And there are you know, a number of very significant personalities, both men and women, made huge contributions to the efforts to emancipate Africa. And you know that needs to be recorded and that needs to be acknowledged. We are not a passive people. And you know, and that's what I'm trying to do with this piece. You know, the people who have fought for independent struggles and also who have made significant contributions in different areas of culture, from the sciences to the arts as well and the people fundamentally who have been involved in that process of nation building within Africa as well, um, I thought needed to be celebrated and acknowledged. And so that's what I've done with this piece. Yeah, and it's so powerful. I, I was very moved seeing it. Could, could we go on please, Ruth? And, and these, um, the classical works like this, the discus thrower, which, uh, you know, they, again, they interrogate that enlightenment period um, in which so many of these attitudes um, really come to prominence. Um, and it also deals with our current fear with facing into that period and interrogating where issues of you know, where, where racism and issues of race and colonialism, where they actually came from. I found this, this body of work enormously powerful as well. Yes, yeah, so um, many of us are used to seeing uh, classical sculptures as white. Now, we know that those sculptures were not always white. They were in fact painted. Now there is a German uh, historian uh, called Johann Winkelmann. Now Johann Winkelmann suggested that, um, you know, the classical sculptures were white because of the superiority of the Aryan race. And I felt that, you know, of course this is, this is nonsense. Um, you know, it's now well documented that those paintings were white uh, were not white and the whiteness came from the paint actually fading off the sculptures and so this is a process of returning the color to those sculptures and suggesting then that 
actually there is no culture which is sort of isolated. You know, the Romans uh, got the idea from the Greeks, you know, and so um, we always, you know, there's no such thing as a kind of pure culture. You know, we influence each other and we, we evolve our, our art and our, you know, heritage in that way. And so the globe is actually sort of claiming uh, those works as, you know, part of human endeavor to the uh, emergence of, of culture generally, generally. So, and that's uh, what I'm sort of doing here by uh, deconstructing those uh, classical sculptures. Mm -hmm. and, and can we go on, please, Ruth? And, and it, it's part of a, of, of a number. Um, and they all have the globe, but the, you know, wh wh why the globe? It, wh what was your thinking then? Well, you know, again, it goes back to what I said about how culture emerges and how culture emerges through trade and throughout history. And so human culture has always been about how we influence each other. And so the globe there for me represents uh, some kind of universal humanity. And of course, uh, you know, when people start talking about pureness or pureness of a race, or they're not necessarily thinking about uh, you know, humankind, they're, they're, they're thinking about nationalism. And actually, this approach here is the opposite of nationalism. This is, this is sort of reclaiming heritage for humanity as a whole. Mm, that's beautiful. Could we go on, please, Ruth? And how, why did you choose these particular works, the Venus de Milo, the, uh, the, 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 the David? I mean, how, why did you choose these particular works? Yes, I mean, I chose those works because, I mean, those are kind of um, anchors, if you like, of uh, European civilization. I mean, they are, they are emblems of European civilization. You know, they are, they are so well known, and I sometimes choose iconic works uh, to say, to make very important points, because I, again, there's the question of access. And I want to be in dialogue with, with a public that can have some access to what I'm trying to, to say. Mm -hmm. Could we go on, please, Ruth? And, and, and here with the kind of the scales of justice and that, you know, I mean, justice isn't, as we've seen over the course of this last year, it's not something that is, um, that has been impacted in a powerful way by um, the sorts of changes that we would like to see. I mean, do you feel kind of optimistic about the future, particularly at this time, as we've we've seen kind of the rise of Black Lives Matters, we've seen kind of ambiently that there are profound changes. Do you feel that we are in a place where we should feel begin to feel optimistic about the future? You know, um... I'm sure you saw Biden's inauguration. Yes. And the young woman, the poet. Yes. And she's only 22, 22 years old. And so we have a generation that it, it's actually our duty to be optimistic. You know, regardless, you know, I'm a glass half full person. Yeah. You know, and I and I believe that some of the mistakes that we're making, they're, they're human mistakes. And humans can also unmake those mistakes. You know, and I think that we have to, our survival depends on us being optimistic. You know, there is actually no other way. Hmm. You know, and I think that, you know, as an artist, we, we as artists, we sort of raise those issues but I certainly am not raising those issues because I feel that, you know, it is the end of us as humans. I want, I want survival. I want us to collaborate and work together and make things better. And we have to, we have to do that. 
And, you know, remind me the name of the, the poet. Do you have it off the top of your head? You know, the, the, the young, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name, but um, yeah, I thought yeah, she well, was. You know who I mean? Yes, yes. I mean, you know, Amanda Gorman, somebody is saying, yeah, thank you. Yeah, Amanda Gorman, incredible. You know, absolutely incredible. I was blown away by listening to her. You know, if she is able to be optimistic, then I have to be. Hmm. But, but, but the thing about, for most minorities, that there is a sense in which optimism is something which is usually kind of, um, it's usually something which is reserved for very particular kinds of people. And it's so hard, it takes so much work to be optimistic in the face of so much. And at this moment, it can feel, I think, for particularly many young people, like the forces that are standing in the way of progress are gaining um, a sense of confidence um, and boldness. And um, it can feel overwhelming. And I agree with you that we need to, we need to have a confidence and um, an audacity to actually reclaim a sense of momentum and optimism, but it takes a lot of effort. Yes, but you know, I most I take comfort from the fact that despite the fact that Donald Trump tried to, um, you know, compromise the results of the elections in the, in the United States, he did not succeed because people voted and people got out and, and they voted. And that message to young people is that, you know, vote for change. You know, it can work. And we've seen it work, you know, despite all of the difficulties, people getting out to vote actually worked. Mm. And, and, you know, so we have that power. We, 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 we have something, we can, you know, we can vote and get the leader uh, that, that, we, that we want. And I think that, you know, and I think that's a very powerful thing. Mm. And then could we go on, Ruth, please? Now these are these are marvelous wind sculptures. I, and I, as as a an ex director of the National Museum of African Art uh, um, in DC, that one of my great pleasures was coming in every morning and seeing one of these outside our building as our one of our proudest um, parts of our collection. Could you could you talk a little bit about them, please? Yes. So you know we've talked today a bit about public sculpture and monuments. And you know what kind of sculpture do we do we have in our in the public realm? Do we have you know diverse works of art? Do we have works by contemporary African artists within our, within the public realm? And what do those works actually represent? So after doing the ship in a bottle in Trafalgar Square, you know, and looking at the sales on that, I that the cells inspired a body of work. And, you know, they evoke for me the sense of movement, uh, migration, and also questions around monuments and sculpture. What is sculpture? You know, um, and so, you know, sculpture is something that has weight, volume, and so on. And what I'm doing here is completely deconstructing that and actually saying, okay, can we actually sculpt something that's not there? Is it even possible to sculpt wind? So in a way, this is a sculpture of nothing. And, and you know, it, it's, you know, it's not, it's, this is the opposite of didactic sculpture. You know, this is not didactic sculpture. This is, this is playful, it's colorful, it's meaningful too, in the sense that it deals with issues of migration in a very subtle manner. And it deals also with the issue of multiculturalism and diversity within the realm, within the public realm. Mm. And so that's how those works evolved. Could, could we see an, another one, Ruth, if we... 
and that they are exquisite and that um i mean how how were they made because they look so so light yeah so this is uh, the uh, fiberglass and there's a metal structure at the center so that's what's keeping it up but then it's painted fiberglass and it's painted you know in the patterns of, of, of the fabrics uh, and I design all of the uh, uh, the images on the on the um, you know on the public sculptures, but they're they're also fun. I mean, you know, I I enjoy working on them very much, and designing them, and so and I know that you know it gives the public fun too, and it it's just like a splash of color in the gray city, you know. I I remember I had one. We may have an image here, but. There was one in Central Park in New York, and it just looked exquisite. I did see that one, and it it, it did transform. It, it it is transformational of both the viewer, but also of the landscape within which it sits. And as you say, created by something which is mainly an animation of 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 wind through 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 cloth but which is actually not cloth as you say so it's an extraordinary thing extraordinary yeah. and can we see more yeah gosh and this is this is this the royal academy is that correct? yeah this is the royal academy this is during the summer exhibition and uh so that was a temporary installation mm. but it was uh, it was fun to have one next to reynolds there <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, also at the Royal Academy. Yes, exactly. And and what the reaction? Not I mean, because the Royal Academy, particularly over the summer, it attracts lots of people who come from all over Britain to come and see it. And it and it represents it represents the both the art establishment, but also um, it represents a kind of an accessibility to the arts. And, you know, I think that is one of the intersections that you managed to traverse so well of, of being someone who is absolutely rooted and fits perfectly in the context of, of great august institutions like this, but at the same time, it represents something that feels of the people. Well, you know, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's important to, to always give that access, you know, to to be in dialogue with the audience um, that you're sort of, you know, I mean, I'd, I've never really understood artists who produce work that the audience can't really kind of engage with. And uh, what's the point? Mm -hmm. And could we go on, please? Yeah. And this, of course, in my uh, the, my old employer, the uh, Smithsonian, this National Museum of African Art, and it's just a glorious piece. And it sits in the Enid Hout Garden, which is just to the north of the castle, um, adjacent to our front entrance. So everyone who comes in and leaves, that they get the chance to see it. And I think the connection, as you say, to narrative, to history, to social justice to the arts to um to africa in all of its complexity to the the magic of the arts it's everything which uh, namafa that institution um is about and it's all beautifully encapsulated in this one glorious piece that you pass as you as you enter and you and you leave the the, the building should we go on please and this is, of course, the um, the uh, the Central Park one, which um, again I would pass quite often. Yes, no, I mean that was fun to to do that in New York. And, and they all they they all transform the place that they're in, as well as uh, you know being discreetly beautiful. But um, it's about them enhancing the environment, which is something that you would always want from public art. Yeah, no, absolutely, you know. Should, can we go on, please? Yeah, um, and the, that was the novel. So if you step back, wow. Oh, yes, Novel <laughs> Foundation in um, in um, Cape Town. Yeah, yeah. and um, so there's uh, Cape Town. An absolutely uh, gorgeous setting as well. Yes, at the novel, uh, novel Foundation. Mm. Yeah. And Ruth, should, can we go on? Yeah, and this is in Boston. If we go back. 
Yeah, so that's uh, that's in Boston at the moment. It is wonderful, and it, and as a as a particular body of work, just demonstrating how you can do such a wide variety of things, but also within any discrete area, how you can really kind of push the parameters of of your practice. Um, it's just another exceptional chapter in this amazing story of your work. And we're now going to kind of finish with some of your current, one of your current projects, which is um, 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 what you're doing both in, in Hackney in East London, but also in, um, in Nigeria. Could you, could you talk to us a little bit about this? Yes, yeah, so uh, this is my studio in, in London. And I have a gallery in my studio. And for about uh, 11 years, I've been given uh, artist space to show for a month. And that could be dance, it could be visual arts, it could be, and the idea, you know, as you know, Gus, in London, it's really difficult for artists to find spaces to work. You know, it's just become very expensive, you know, and spaces to show their work. So I wanted to provide that platform in my studio. And so, you know, I've, I've been doing that for 10 years. It's called Guest Projects. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and then after 10 years of doing that, now on the 11th year, um, I decided to, to make the residency international. So, and then um, I, re I registered a foundation, which is the Yin Kashonbari Foundation. And then we're going to do, so in Lagos, uh, it's called Guest Artists, Guest Artist Space Foundation in Lagos, which is a gas foundation. And so we're actually in the process of building a purpose-built building so that we, I will then be able to invite three artists and they will have workspace there and they can work in a comfort residency for three months. Amazing. And the residency is open to all art forms, including curators. Fantastic. So that, you know, and, and writers as well, um, visual artists. Um, but the residency is also in two parts. So artists will also be able to go to the countryside. So we have a 54 acre farm, two hours from Lagos, and we are already practicing uh, sustainable farming there. So we we are growing a number of crops from you know peppers, cassava, tomatoes, maize, uh, yams, plantains, uh, and we are able to. We're already actually supplying people food locally. And I had to build a three-kilometer road to wow. provide access into. Uh, the farm. So I've managed to do that because so I had to do some infrastructure work. Uh, but that said, um, you know, it's a very exciting thing and the agriculture is going very well. And we also have greenhouses. Now we, I think we're up to about 10 uh, greenhouses now uh, to grow crops like, you know, tomatoes, uh, peppers. And then, you know, we, we're planting, we're doing open field farming as well. And we, we've just planted a lot of kind of fruits as well, different fruits. And, um, but the, the important thing is to connect the urban and the rural areas. And artists will, you know, because Lagos is kind of, it's a city like any other, you know? So I thought it will be nice for artists to experience uh, being in the countryside. So the farm is in a place called Ijebu. And so we can look at uh, some more images. Yeah, that's just some of our uh, residency events. And then that's uh, Guest Artist Space Foundation. This is when I went to Lagos to talk to some of the artists uh, about what we're going to be doing because I think it's important that local people are involved at the outset. Okay, so can we go to the next one? And so that's the building that we are nearly finishing now. So that's a, 
an artist's sort of illustration of the building, but we uh, uh, the, the building should be completed around June uh, time. So, but we're making very good progress on that building. Okay, and then we go to the next one. And then this is uh, the barn house where artists will stay on the farm. We've, we've also started building that building. Okay, the next one. And this building is done with local mud. Slow down, we said. <laughs> this building is uh, built with local materials. And so with a kind of local soil and everything. And also local people are trained in how to build such, uh, such buildings. Okay, so can we go? And this is at the very beginning of the farm when we, when we just planted things. Uh, and you can see that the landscape is absolutely stunning. Okay, and the next one. And so some of our crops in the greenhouses. And, the, and that's some of our crops there. You can see some of the harvest and really looking beautiful and nice. Okay, and then the next one. And that's all I have to say, thank well, that's you. That's wonderful. I mean, we're gonna open up to questions, um, Polly, if you want to come back in, but Yinka, just to finish, um, I mean, this is just, extraordinary i mean your your work has always been about giving i mean it's always been for me an, an amazingly um, uplifting inspiring cathartic um but now you are also giving to other artists offering them practical ways of of of, of developing their profession i mean it's just across the course of your career you've been incredibly generous and uh I, and I just see this this particular project as being a real instantiation of that. It's it's wonderful. I hope you're getting lots of support from all of the necessary people to make this happen. Well, you know, we you know, there's as I said, I've registered as a foundation, so with you know, with good governance and so on. And it's called you know Yinka Shonbari Foundation. We have a website, and of course, you know, I welcome support uh, it's it's very important because i can't do this without the support and most importantly i welcome um you know people artists of the african diaspora too particularly because i feel but i don't mean just united kingdom i mean the united states i mean latin america uh you know i think it will be a great experience for um you know artists and people of the african African diaspora, but also it's not exclusively for people of the African diaspora. You know, I welcome people from the United States, from Germany, from Asia. Uh, but I believe that this kind of thing can only be achieved with the support of people. Hmm. So the only way I could possibly succeed would be if people were kind enough to be and be generous to, to, to help us. Mm. I agree. I, I, it's such an important um, project. I, I, it, it is so worthy of support. And I hope, I hope that um, there are people who are listening, who participate tonight, who may know of people who may be in a position to, to help in the ways that, uh, that, 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 that Yinka um, uh, needs. Um, Polly, did you want to, to now move to the, the, the question and answer? Yeah. Gus and Yinka, thank you so much. This has been such an extraordinarily rich and, and valuable conversation. So thank you both for, for this, this wonderful talk. Um, I think there's a lot of questions coming through in the chat. So we'll, we'll definitely come to those and please do keep them coming, everyone who's watching. I know we've got a big audience tonight. We've got um, almost, we're up to almost 300 at some point. Um, so do as they come in, um, I will we'll come to those. But I just want to say that um, I think it's been so valuable to hear you talk tonight, both to get a kind of 
a sense of the sort of historical trajectory of your work, Yinka. Um, but also, I think what really came through in what you're saying is the kind of contemporary urgency of your projects and, and the kind of gift that your work brings to this particular political moment that we find ourselves in, in which history and narrative and the way in which identity is configured, it's really kind of under so much pressure at the moment. And I think that, you know, the way in which you approach historical narratives and really opening the space to all different views of history and different views of the sort of entanglements of, you know, our global interconnected world, you know, this really comes through in your work in a way that's so politically engaged and yet never didactic you know it's sort of serious and playful at the same time and i think you know it's it's just such a it's just such a great gift that that your work brings in this way so i don't know if that's something you'd like to talk more about Yinka, about the your your approach to history and your your kind of political engagement i mean that's something that's i think come through in your conversation a lot tonight but i don't know if there's anything else you want you want to add to that um, I can also, um, perhaps should we do a couple of questions at a time, that might be a good way to do it. I yeah. think that might relate to one question that came through quite early on, which was about disciplinary boundaries. So um, it was a SOAS alumni was asking about the way in which um, his art history is taught and historically, of course, um, SOAS was a space you know, and it's still a space where we have a regional focus in which, you know, we look at African art, we study African art history, um, and there's a sort of, you know, long tradition of doing that. But I think, you know, one of the things that comes through in your practice, Yinka, is how interconnected we are. And, you know, you remind us that it really is impossible to talk about the history of African art without talking about Britain. And it's impossible to talk about British art without talking about the history of Africa. You know, this it's impossible to, to separate these two. So I don't know if there's something there you'd like to address either of you, Yinka or Gus, um, and then we'll, we'll go on to some more questions. Well, I mean, I, I think that you know, well put, really. I mean, I, I think, unfortunately, I mean, we, we know that um, nationalisms evolve out of this um, uh, pretense to, to, to uh, isolationism. And, and then we also know that that leads to fascism. You know, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a kind of, that's the equation you're looking at, you know, when you're when you're sort of denying everybody else and you're kind of giving yourself this sort of special uh, special place. You know, I think that we are kind of interconnected. You know, I mean, even very simple things like, you know, environment and environmental issues. I mean, you're not, you know, you're not gonna breathe your own air. You know, you, you, have, to, you have to share it, you know, where we can't separate ourselves, you know, the whole, we also know fully well that the whole idea of a nation is a very modern construct. You know, people didn't see themselves in sort of divided nations. You know, there are kind of no sort of boundaries, uh, uh, artificial boundaries in that way. So I think that we've created them and we need to start dismantling those boundaries that we created. Absolutely. And I think in the, the context that we're currently in of this, this global pandemic, I think reminds us as much as anything of how interconnected we are and how kind of arbitrary these, these borders are. And I don't think we've ever been more connected in some ways, even though we're all isolating in, in our own little homes. Um, thank you, Yinka. Should we go on to some of these other questions? I don't know if there's any in the chat that you want to address in particular, but I can I can summarize some of them. Um, so one question that came up um, was about your commission in Leeds to, to um, create a memorial to David Oluwale. Um, so uh, one, one, part, one audience member asked, how are you approaching this commission? Um, and how relevant is it to the present moment? I mean, I know that this is, I think, it happened in 1969. It's the case of kind of police harassment and brutality that led to the death of this 
Man, and I, I understand that it's the last um, example of the police being uh, convicted for a, a death in, in custody or, a, you know, for a, a police death. Um, do you want to say a bit more about how you're approaching it and how it's perhaps relevant to, to the current moment? Well, I mean, I think for those who are not aware of the case, um, David Oluwale came from Nigeria and you know he was living in Leeds um he was he actually came to study engineering and then unfortunately that didn't quite uh work out as planned so he was taking odd jobs in Leeds and but he was constantly harassed uh you know racial abuse and so on and then he was also brutalized by the police and he was found uh dead drowned in the river and um, and that has been, you know, that death. And then there was a case, you know, as well. The, the police were charged. Well, they went to court anyway. Um, but but, uh, and I think that it's been a, um, you know, very kind of unfortunate of story. Uh, what happened there? But also, unfortunately, we're still seeing some of that today. And so what happened to David you know, Oluwale is really kind of symbolic. And it's something that we can all learn a lot from. And so I've been commissioned to make a memorial uh, to him, but I mean, I, you know, unfortunately I, I've, I've been told that I can't say much about this in public right oh. now. So I can, I can, I can say that, um, I've accepted the commission, but I can't explicitly say uh, what I'm going to do. Otherwise, I'd be happy to, to share that. But I've been, you know, specifically told not to. Okay, so no I'm, not, I'm not right. able to. All right, we'll we'll just have to wait, um, wait and see it then. All right, thanks, Yinka. Um, perhaps we can. I mean, obviously, you know that that commission relates, you know, to some of the things that you've been talking about, doesn't it? And the way in which history is remembered, and the way in which these narratives are told in the public space, and how you know contested that can be. Um, perhaps that relates to another question that's coming from Lara, and I don't know if Gus as well. You might if you can both speak to this one which is what steps can museums take to decolonize so you know what kind of active steps can can we take as um as academics as artists as museum directors to to decolonize the narratives of the public space any any ideas for practical steps <laughs> would you like me to um yeah. oh, uh We've been talking about this for the 150 years of, of my career, and um, we haven't actually managed to shift the dial, but if ever there was a time in which there was both opportunity and need, it is now. And um, um, I mean, certainly at the VNA, which, you know, even from its, 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 its name, you know that there is a kind of, a kind of pretty, um, imperative need for us to address these things that we have begun to look at, you know, across the, the, the across the spectrum from our staffing to our programs to our acquisitions to our partnerships. Um, but indeed, the reason why I was um, um, uh, uh, invited back to Britain um, into my new role was to found a new bit of the VNA, which is its fundamental um, uh, drive is to engage with a new audience through the collection, to deal with all of those sorts of contentious issues, but rather than burying them and rather than kind of dealing with them in an awkward way, but to foreground them, that we want to, we want to actually begin to unpick those histories and to find ways of hopefully building kind of shared dialogue and I would pray some kind of catharsis. Um, and so, and I look across at my, uh, at my colleagues in other national institutions from, from Tate to the British Museum and there's a recognition that it's long overdue for us to deal with them. It, it's not that we have the answers. It's not that we have, um, you know, the resource to do it, but the, but 
we must find those things. We have no choice. And uh, there is, um, I think, amongst all of the leadership, but also, I think, amongst all of the staff that I engage with at those national museums, a sense that, a sense that this is the time in which we've got to stop just talking about it. We've got to deliver. And so I'm excited by this moment as an opportunity. You know, I am, of course, daunted by it as, um, you know, the, the sort of the scale of the challenge. And it coincides with then being uh, greater compromises on resource than at any point in my memory. But we will find the ways of delivering because we simply have to. Well, everyone's very excited to have you in charge, Gus. I think it's, <laughs> it's a wonderful appointment. Um, I mean, of course, one of the questions I think is how do you do this in a way that is really kind of fundamentally changing the landscape rather than just in terms of optics or just in a sort of visual way? Um, you know, how do you make these sort of real deep changes that, that need to be made? I don't know, um, Yinka, do you want to say a bit about that as well? I mean, um, how do you feel your your work kind of relates to this sort of sudden um, impulse to decolonize, suddenly everybody is talking about it. But as you said at the beginning, you know, these sort of discussions really have been happening, of course, for a very long time. Um, so how do you feel about how your work sort of relates to this present moment and these discussions about decolonization? Well, you know, I mean, one message I would like for the various museums is that, you know, I've been going to museums now for many, many years. And I've been working with various curators. And I have to say, you know, I don't see senior staff. I don't see a diverse senior staff in museums. And I think, you know, it's one thing to talk about it, but you have to look at the people that you're actually employing to work in those places. And not, you know, and I don't mean sort of, you know, interns or junior curators, or I'm talking about actually actually directors of museums. And I think that, so museums need to look at that very carefully and think about who they're actually employing. And I can assure them, they're not going to regret it because the, uh, the younger audiences are very diverse. And if you want to stay alive and you want to carry on, you have to, you know, diversity is crucial it's actually crucial to your bank balance. You know, I mean, that's a very kind of uh, Philistine thing to say, but it's absolutely important because you can actually broaden your scope and your market. So you can only gain from it. You're not going to lose from it. You know, so I think if the museums are brave enough to actually start at the level of the board and at the senior level, then I will believe that they're serious. But if they're not doing that, I won't believe them. Yeah, yeah. whether it's, yeah, yeah. No, of course. Gus, did you want to come back? No, no, I was just saying I will relay that, but I think it's generally, <laughs> absolutely, we've got to begin at the board, but also critically with, particularly in museums, there is that middle echelon of curators who, are really, you know, that is an area that we have to address and that they are some of the longest service, serving um, bits of a museum that you look at directors come and go, but curators, they stay forever. And I think, you know, that is an area where we must invest in trying to, um, to, to, to make some change. Sorry. Well, don't forget, Gus, you know, as well as I do, that a number of black curators have done internships, right? And yeah. they keep creating opportunities for um, you know black curators to join museums and they do and they, they do those internships and they do all those programs but actually does that result in long-term employment or even any kind of power within the institution I agree with you I agree I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm as frustrated um, as as you are Yinka about all of these things and that I fought from the fringes in trying to make these changes. I was the very first diversity person at, um, uh, at the British Museum. You know, that was my first role in museums. And I have spent most of my career 
trying to push for these changes. But for the very first time in Britain, I'm in a position where I can actually begin to um, uh, change the patterns and flow of resource in ways that will mean that there will be meaningful change. And so, and I look across at my peers and there is an equally hungry appetite for making those changes. I mean, I, I don't say this lightly, but I genuinely feel that at no point in my career have I felt more optimistic about this particular area? And, but we've got a huge distance to travel. We've got so much work to do, so much change. And we're doing it, as I was saying, in a time when it's been tougher because of challenges to resource to do it. So, you know, watch this space and keep asking the difficult questions because we've got to be kept on our toes. Um, you know, please, it's, it's please, does. No, no more reports. <laughs> no, please, we don't, you know, we don't I'm want any more. We don't, I don't know what happens to all these reports anyway, or if anybody even reads them. I don't, you know, we don't want any more reports. We just yeah, want you guys yeah. to do stuff. Yeah, I, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of questions coming in in the chat about restitution and um, the sort of role of museums in, in restitution. So I don't know if you want to speak about that, but I, I just want to bring up perhaps this one question from Richard Hilton, which is that how does the panel view the present UK government's sentiments towards woke worthies and pushback on BLM? Because I think, and this comes through in your, your talk, you know, this kind of fantastic sense of optimism and energy that you both have for this moment and kind of ways forward for this moment. And, you know, I think that's really what is needed in this current situation. Um, but of course, we're at that, that point, aren't we, where, you know, at the same time, there's, there's this energy to decolonize and to, to engage in these new different histories, but at the same time, there's a pushback. So the government has been, for example, you know, there's this law that's just passed, isn't there, to protect the monuments, um, that, so to protect the monuments, um, you know, so a sort of a restriction on direct action and, and popular action in terms of how history is, is understood in the public space. So. How do you view that? Um... But the law, a law wouldn't have changed what happened to Colston, that at the end of the day, that if there'd been some official saying, but you're breaking the law, look, it's written, I don't think it would have, that there is an ambient shift and it may well be, I mean, my view is that um, in part, what we're seeing is a kind of death rattle and it's a violent death rattle of, particular of a particular very vociferous segment of the population and genuinely that across the wider at least the museum sector that I work within that there is that the, the ambient shift is towards is is toward the sorts of things that we are supporting that if you are against them that you must be feeling a great weight of of kind of um, a, a sense of being standing against against what is happening, and I think I I, I genuinely do think that um, there is great cause in this particular area for optimism. Of course, they're shouting and screaming, but I see that as a kind of death rattle of a very particular view, and it may well be finding coherence around things that are happening politically. But if you look at what happened at the end for Trump, that even some of the sorts of demographies that would have been his core constituencies, they were the ones that stood against him to deny him those critical votes in those constituencies that would have given him any basis for pushing back. I do think that there are shifts, changes that we should feel optimistic about. And it, it speaks to what Yinka was saying earlier that the thing they will deny us is our optimism. They're gonna deny us not just our voice, but it's the thing of a young people feeling that they will have a chance of making the changes. I think we are closer now to making those changes and seeing them actually become part of, 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 of ambient um, accept, acceptable belief than at any point in my life. Yeah, no, I mean, I second that. I think, you know, 
I think it's sort of self-evident, you know, that th this stuff can't go on this way forever, you know, and a lot of young people will not allow that to happen to them. You know, they, they have, they're far better connected than we ever were. And, um, you know, and I think that also with the, with the power to vote, and as you say, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm not defe defeatist, I'm never defeatist. I'm not going to say, oh, well, you know, that's it, you know, uh, where, you know, we can't be proactive or we're powerless. No, we're not powerless. And we do have something that counts and that's our ability to vote. Mm. And, you know, I know that the mayor of London is setting up a review panel uh, to look at street names and uh, monuments. And, and that's done in an orderly manner because that's based on the community. So there's some kind of fallacy that people are going to be going around pulling down statues. That, that's just some kind of somebody else's fantasy. That's not happening. You know, so I don't know where all this stuff comes from mm. or what people are afraid of. Absolutely, I love your optimism. And um, yeah, I think it's a case of, you know, moving forward with this energy, you knowing the momentum at this moment in, in positive new directions. And hopefully you're right and things really are changing. I like the idea of this death rattle, Gus. I'll hold <laughs> on to that. I'm going to keep that. Um, so let's maybe, um, there's a few questions that have come through about collaboration. So maybe that would sort of segue into, into a sort of discussion about how collaborations might be useful in terms of developing positive strategies for what we're talking about. So two questions. There's one from Patri Patricia Davis says, have you ever engaged with educational institutions to encourage the inclusion of colonial history on the curriculum? Your works would be such an attractive starting point for all ages, all age groups and communities. Um, well, and I, well, then just say that question, so. I am I am already in the national curriculum. So and a number of schools study my work. So, um, so you know, yes, so somebody, you know, that's already, that's already happening. Um, and then there's a second one which relates to that from Craig Stevens says, with the goal of making historical narratives about the black experience more accessible, how can we be most efficient in collaborations between historians, social scientists and artists? Through what efforts can we best encourage the production of content that pulls from archaeological and anthropological data? Um, would either of you like to speak speak to those? I think Gus um, should take this one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I personally think that the place of intersection for these sorts of things is naturally somewhere like SOAS. I mean, that in terms of its history, but also, I mean, it's its recent history from the from the kind of the moment of of decolonization, there was a sense of SOAS being a kind of um, a space in which one could engage in, in 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 debates that felt like they had resonances across the globe, and it's always felt to me like a place of of real a, 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 of 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 kind of catalyst a catalytic place in which could really kind of shift thinking. And I do think in the 21st century, in the kind of the age of kind of Greta Thunbergs and Gen Z uh, really kind of wanting to see ambient shifts of us having, <clears throat> excuse me, the technologies to actually speak to peoples across the global South with real efficiency and effectiveness. I would have felt that somewhere like SOAS, it's a great moment for it to become the point of intersection for considerations of how we actually shift thinking, particularly in schools and universities around these issues. Um, we need, we need the, um, we need to have the kind of the 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 the, the, the knowledge, the the kind of the, the the data. If you Google Africa and Google African art and look at the stuff after a couple of pages that starts to come up. It's just not the sort of thing that you would want young people to be seeing. We need institutions like SOAS, and I, you know, if there's any way in which I can support this, to begin to push back against that with the sorts of resources that can feed into curricula, that can 
feed into um, into the sorts of things that if people are in their own time are just wanting to find information that can really help to serve them, putting pressure on institutions like the BBC to begin to shift the dial. You know, I think it's time for us as institutions to begin to 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 be legislating alongside Gen Z to be they want to see the changes, but they need the infrastructure within which they can actually make those changes count. And it's in spaces like SOAS where that could really happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Gus. Um, absolutely. There's um, there's a lot happening at SOAS at the moment. And yeah, this is I'm certainly sure. the questions that we're, we're exploring and, and working towards, things that we're working towards. Perhaps thinking about that, then can we expand that to think about um, what's going on in, in Africa and the continent. There's a few questions have come in about, um, there was one question about boundaries and the idea of identity and boundaries and how artists in West Africa are, are, are approaching that. Another question about Ramald Hazme's work and how, how you might relate to that. Um, but I, and another question also about, um, from Angelica about the, the political situation, what are your views on the political situation in Uganda and, and Nigeria in terms of political change? So I don't know if either of you want to speak a little bit about your views on what's happening. Let's let's focus on Nigeria, because I know Yinka, you're working there. Um, your views on the sort of artistic and political landscape, any, any reflections on that? Well, I mean, I think that it's very important to, uh, you know, to speak about the context when you, when you're actually, you know, when you feel kind of immediately connected to it. Because I think that, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the kind of politically things have been, you know, Nigeria has a, Nigeria's had a kind of a difficult history, you know, politically. And Nigeria is sort of, you know, evolving like everybody, like everywhere else. And I think that in the context of what just happened at, cap at the capital in the United States, I think, you know, we can't sort of sit in the West and start pointing a finger because, you know, it's just not, you know, those things are not tenable anymore. You know, that can't, you know, that can't be the way. I mean, I think the, the, the best way is to understand that societies evolve according to their own history. And, you know, we're all striving for a, a better democratic government in, the, in a lot of these places, but we also have to take into account the socio-economic issues that lead to conflict. So we need a broader understanding of context before we start talking about it. Yeah. But I feel, you know, I. I look at Nigeria and I see some of the sorts of interventions that are beginning to be made in terms of, of the museum sector. And after some generations of, 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 of what can only be called inertia, that there is real, again, cause for optimism. You know, looks, looking at ways in which strategic partnerships can be made with institutions um, around the world, in looking at um, ways in which objects, um, contended ob ob objects, contentious objects, that they can be um, uh, um, reaccommodated within um, collections um, in Nigeria. There's, there is a lot to feel enormously optimistic about. And one looks at the contemporary sector and what is happening, you know, both in terms of, 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 of the commercial um, work which is happening, but also in terms of collectors as well. And it is astonishing. I think what we don't do as a continent is to aggregate and, um, these things in ways um, in which they are me so meaningfully done um, in, in Europe that we need, you know, the equivalents of of, of, of arts councils, of, of, uh, of, of British councils, of institutions that both fund and additionally um, promote the works of, of, of artists um, in, 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 on the continent. Um, and I think that would make a huge difference. I mean, if you look at the cultural sectors 
in 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 Europe and North America, the amount of money that they 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 draw into um, those nations, and if we get it together on the African continent, I think this will be a sector of the creative industries that could absolutely kind of transform economies and um, it's worthy of the tiny amounts of investment that it would require to seed these things mm -hmm. and of the time and the support of the institutions that have been pushing uphill um, for a generation without the support of of the of, of the state we but, need to but no, you see Gus I agree with uh, what you're saying precisely but I think on the African continent um my view from going to Nigeria is mm. that we need to deal well first of all institutions and infrastructure is a major major yeah. issue um, you know, I just told you about building a three kilometer farm to, to uh, uh, road to have access to the farm and then building the residency space. So and the private sector in Nigeria is beginning to do a lot. Um, as you know, there is Art X in Lagos, the, the art fair, the annual art fair, uh, which is incredibly popular. And all that most of that is supported by the banks and, and private individuals. Mm. And highly impressive what the private sector is actually managing to achieve. And there are, you know, a number of collectors. Uh, in Lagos, there is the, so it's slowly happening. There's the Yoruba Museum that's being built in Lagos. There is the museum that's being built in Benin City. Absolutely. As well that David Ajay is, uh, you know, working on that. So, you know, I mean, it took America, you know, a long time and also European countries, but, you know, Africa, is starting to get to that point. But I think that at, at this point in time, it does seem to me that a lot of it is being driven by the private sector for the most part. It is, but I would argue that in somewhere like Nigeria, which we're talking about a rounding error in terms of the budgets, the national budgets that would be needed to be invested to completely transform the um, the state sponsored museum sector, you know, to invest in a new generation of museums that was, you know, then able to to to, to broker loans globally, you know, I, I and the way in which that would pay back would be astonishing. It would be but astounding. You know, you are aware of Zaid Smoker. In, I am yes in South Africa, and of course when Zaid Smoker. Uh, first started, the, the main issue was actually the question of training curators. Yes. And so they began a process of actually supporting curators to be trained. Because you also know that if you were to build all of those museums, then you need to build the skills set and the skills infrastructure. Mm. And I think so, and you know, it's a process yeah. And I know it's happening. You know, I know it's it's definitely happening, but it's a it's a slow process. Mm. Because once you build the museums, then you have to have the the staff and the training yeah. um, to do it. You know, and and as you know, with the museums, you know, it's a big machine. You need conservators, you need curators, Absolutely. you need, you know, and you need technicians. And so I think that actually the the focus should be on skills training because you cannot build those structures without the skill set required to actually run them mm, mm, mm. and i and i think many africa there are so many qualified african curators and intellectuals and but unfortunately currently you know well most of us are in the diaspora mm. and i think you know because that there, there should also be a way to invite people back to kind of, you know, head some of those institutions as well uh, combined with local skills and lo you know, locally uh, qualified people, you know, would, but I think there would need to be some kind of um, attempt to bring back also some people within the diaspora to, to work within those institutions because, you know, without the skill set, you can't really run those places. 
There's quite a few questions coming in on restitution. I don't know if you, either of you would like to speak to this. Obviously, you're, um, it's, it's a question that, that comes up a lot, especially at the moment. It's a very kind of current issue. And when we're talking about these, um, these institutions that are being built, you know, like the, the museum in Benin, for example, that's being built specifically to, to house the, the, the Benin, the Benin material from the British Museum and, and you know, in these sort of global collections. What are your thoughts on, on, on this? And perhaps we can link it back to your work, Yinka, and keep, you know, because of course, you know, this, it's such a sort of recurrent theme in your practice as well, the sort of movement of objects between Africa and Europe and, and you know, that sort of circulation of objects. So- No, I mean, I think, I think if you steal something, you should give it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't actually, I don't think that's over complicated. No. You know, I mean, if you steal something, you should give it back. Yeah. You know, I, I want it back, you know, give me back my stuff. You know, I mean, Gus, I don't know what you think. Is it complicated? <laughs> I don't think it doesn't have to be, but, um, and, and I think it, it's being increasingly simplified. Um, and genuinely, I think if you were to get, um, most of the kind of um, senior museum directors who have who have this contended um, material in their in their collections, if you were to get them into um, a, a private conversation, that I would imagine, I don't think there would be any of them who wouldn't be completely agreeing with you. I think it is now about a kind of an alignment of of a, of a number of things which are incredibly boring and of um, finding the best way of doing it. Yeah, but you know, that's usually, that's an excuse. Uh, um, you know, that, the, that's just an excuse really, because um, if you're serious about giving something back, you'll find a way to give it back. Yeah, so, I, mean, I, the, the, I the, genuinely the, think over the course of the next five years, I would say there'll be a significant move. I would think over the course of the next two years, you'll begin to see um, the sorts of things that you are talking about happen. And I think that um, um, it's not just that there is a kind of ambient shift. Um, I think that um, there is a kind of a credibility need for these things to happen. So I don't think the points of opposition aren't they aren't, when I began my career, that there was a kind of ideological kind of hardcore for whom this would have been something that would be almost beyond the possibility of considering. And I don't think, I think those people have all retired and gone away or have just- okay, I'm gonna ask you a complicated question then. Okay. Do you think the Elgin marbles should be returned? Do I think? They should be returned. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, for a variety of reasons, I probably shouldn't answer that. But I think you, you, you know, that um, um, I would love to see. I would love to see kind of a far greater equity, and um, I would love to see kind of um, objects being able to tell stories in their place of origin, in the way in which they they haven't been over the course of the last kind of, you know, 200 years because of basically um, the concentration of, of resource in a tiny number of, of, of countries. So I would, you know, absolutely kind of, you know, want to see shifts and changes, but I mean, I don't want to be quoted on the front page of the, uh, of the Daily Mail. I have work to do and I, what I don't want is that for my, for, you know, if you think about the role that I have, and it will be so easy for the Daily Mail to make my particular life impossible. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I have to think strategically about, you know, how I apply my energies to these particular things. No, well, 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 well evaded. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Put you on the spot there, Gus. Sorry about that. Um, Maybe we could loop back to so Joy in the in the chat says, what about the Black British Museum project currently being considered in collaboration with the Black Cultural Archives? Do you feel that's a good idea? And I suppose this kind of question 
relates to, uh, you know, earlier on in the discussion, we were talking about kind of disciplinary boundaries. Do you think it's, is that the answer to, to think about, you know, specific museums for, for black history or, or should they be included in, in a sort of broader, as part of a broader global narrative? Um, I think we should have, I think we should have both. Yeah. I mean, I would love to see a museum for women. You know, I mean, I don't know if there is actually, is there a museum for women? Um, I don't think so. I'm not, I'm not sure to be not a national one. Absolutely not. Whereas well, in the be. US that there will be fairly soon. There should be a national museum for women to celebrate women's achievement. You yes. know, I think it's important. And I, I, and I don't think that takes away from a national museum. You know, I think, you know, I think actually we need both. Yes. Because, you know, because you need people to have platforms for telling their own stories. Yes. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. Yes. Because, you know, we can always all learn from each other. Yeah, I agree. I so agree. There, there are women's museums in Dakar, in Bamako, um, in Washington, D.C., um, and in Cambridge, apparently, thanks to the chat. So that high well, that, Thank Yeah, you. absolutely. And I think it makes it makes us richer. You know, we, we have you know, you have multiple perspectives in which you can actually understand, we can understand our history. Mm -hmm. um, fantastic. Thank you so much. I don't know if we, if there's anything you guys want to end on. So we've got just nine minutes left. If you want to go right to, to the end, if, any, if you've got any questions that you feel we, you'd like to explore that we haven't explored yet. Is there anything Yinka you'd like to talk about or Gus? Um, no, I mean, uh, you know, pretty much, I mean, are those all of the questions? Uh, um... Well, there's, I mean, there's, there's uh, maybe there's one thing we can end on and then that will loop back to your, to your practice, which might be nice. And that's about, about textiles. So there's a few questions that come in about textiles. And of course, this is so, so central to your practice. And, and, you know, when we're talking about objects moving around and, kind of cultural appropriation of objects, you know, as fabrics, are, 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 they're so kind of central to these histories, aren't they? And one of the questions that came up was about the semiotics in, in the fabrics that you use. Do you, do you engage, I think I, the questions got lost back in the chat. Here we go. There's, there's supposed to be a semiology to each of the fabric designs in wax cotton too. Uh, do, you, do you have specific reasons for using different motifs? So, I don't know if you want to speak to that, but also maybe perhaps more broadly on, on fabrics as a kind of as a kind of metaphor for you know our interconnected the interconnected nature of our world and you know the sort of boundary between self and other and the boundaries around identity. Um, I don't know if there's there's more you'd like to say about that. You know? In a succinct one sentence way. <laughs> Um, um, maybe can you just comment on, on why fabric is such an important part of your work? And then maybe some of these questions will come out through that. Well, okay, so, I mean, you know, you talked about semiotics and you're talking about sort of, you're, you're basically talking about representation and what things mean, you know, the meaning of things. The meaning, the meaning of science, that's what you're talking about. Right, so let's... It wasn't my question, but yes. No, no, put that, yeah, because I wanted to put that in English. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the meaning of signs, what things mean, what they represent. Okay, so, um, you know, the fabrics, you know, obviously that's a, a representation of, you know, culture, um, you know, how do, how do the fabrics sort of represent us and what do they mean, you know, so if somebody, you know, obviously, if you choose to wear certain, you know, if you wear, if you were to wear like Scottish tartan, you know, you're sending out a very particular message about your Scottishness, and you know, people wear African textiles because they want to kind of, you know, celebrate their own heritage or whatever that that might mean. And so, my interest, my interest is mainly in the creation of those signs and what they mean. So my engagement is more to do about, you know, how we manipulate those signs and how we, 
create them, and also for that matter, how those signs can also stand for our, um, you know, emancipation or the messages we would like to give out. Uh, but you know, signs. Uh, I mean, this this issue we're discussing now reminds me of a, a painting by Magritte. And so in that painting, there's a, there's a pipe. You know, it's a painting of the pipe. And at the bottom of the painting of the pipe, it says, this is not a pipe. You know, and so the point there is that actually, in reality, what you're looking at is paint, a, you know, a piece of, a bit of paint and, and on a piece of cloth. And, and then the ways of representing that paint, you know, that pipe through paint and cloth. But actually the actual canvas that the pipe is painted on is actually not a pipe. You know, it's not a pipe, it's a representation of a pipe. But if you take that image to somebody who has never read image or perspective or doesn't know, or, or indeed has never seen a pipe, I mean, it doesn't mean very much. So you need certain cultural codes to understand signs. And so what I do with my work is to manipulate those codes and play with them. I don't know if any of that makes any sense whatsoever. Perfect sense. And that's a wonderful thing to end this session on, I think. But thank you for this evening, Yinka. It's just been absolutely incredible. And, and um, I mean, for me, your work has been kind of something of a, of a cultural compass across the course of my whole career. And it's always, wonderful to uh to spend some time with you just just for me kind of relocating some of the sorts of things that are really important that mean things to me and that inspire and catalyze me in all the work that i do so thank you so much for uh this evening and also thank you to colleagues at soas thank you polly thank you to colleagues you know in the mafa you know i'm missing you so much um and you know, to this whole kind of community of support, amazing questions throughout the evening. And um, it's just a reminder that this kind of portfolio of shared ideas and concerns that is key to your work, key to the work of NAMAFA, key to the work of SOAS is ever more important. Thank you so much, uh, Polly, for hosting this evening. It's been magnificent. I really enjoyed it. And I hope everyone listening at home has enjoyed it as well. Well, yeah, so I think it just leaves, leaves, leaves to me to say thank you to you both as well. Thank you, Gus, for chairing this and, and helping to organise it. I know that you were involved in this collaboration right from the beginning. So thank you for that. And thank you, Yinka, so much. It's been so rich and so engaged and so of the moment. It feels like really the right conversation for this particular moment that we're all in. And your work just offers so much, so much richness to to these conversations so thank you thank both you. well no, it's, uh, thank you you know and it's a it's a pleasure you know pleasure to uh, talk to everyone and um you know yes so thank you and thank you so much thank you smithsonian and thank you for all the support and you know and support our foundation if you can thank yeah. you do, do support the foundation support NAMAFA and support SOAS, that these are all causes that absolutely at this time ever more critical and need our support. Thank you so much.